Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here, bringing you an interview of my own this week. This one with Mr. Eric Nordell of Beach Grove Farm in Pennsylvania. Eric and his wife, Anne, are legends in the small farming world. I first learned about their work on the Farmer to Farmer podcast, which I recommend you go back and listen to that interview uh, if you enjoyed this one. But they have been organic farmers for, I don't know, 40 odd years at this point. And today's topic is, well, low in no-till farming with horses. Yeah. We get into everything from weed management to garlic production and a whole lot more, but I actually don't want to spoil it too much because it's just a fun conversation loaded with tons of interesting details. And so I'll let Eric break it all down for you. But if you enjoy it, like I said, check out that episode of Farmer to Farmer, but also you can read more about their farming on their blog at covercropsincorporated.wordpress.com, which I love a good pun. And they also have a booklet you can check out called Weed the Soil, Not the Crop. You just reach out to Eric via their contact page on that website. We also reference a video in this conversation that you can find on YouTube called uh, Organic No-Till Garlic. And we will put all of those links in the show notes so you don't have to memorize any of that. Um, But anyway, without further blabbering from me, here is my conversation with Eric Nordell of Beach Grove Farm. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by High Mowing Organic Seeds. It's seed browsing season and High Mowing Organic Seeds is celebrating their 30 new seed varieties for 2024. These beautiful and productive vegetable, flower, and herb varieties are 100% organic, non-GMO project verified, and trialed for optimal performance in organic growing systems. Whether you're trying to bring your best to your CSA, wholesale assortment, or to the weekly farmer's market, High Mowing has the professional quality seeds and the grower rep support you need to help get you to harvest. Visit highmowingseeds.com and sign up for your free catalog today. That's highmowingseeds.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Local Line. Get ahead this year with Local Line. Local Line is the all in one sales platform for farmers and food hubs. Increase your sales and streamline your processes with features including e commerce, inventory management, subscriptions, online payments, and more. Trusted by thousands of farmers around the world, Local Line is the platform that you need to take your farm to the next level. Subscriptions start as low as $39 a month. Try Local Line today and receive a free premium feature for one year using our coupon code NO TILL all caps, one word, at localline.ca. That's localline.ca, code no-till. All right, enjoy the show. Eric Nordell, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, greetings from uh, North Central Pennsylvania. I've been a big fan of the podcast and your videos, and I just appreciate the uh, opportunity to give back a little bit. Uh, Well, that's amazing to hear. And I've been a fan of yours since I heard you on the uh, Farmer to Farmer podcast several years ago. So this is this is a very exciting conversation for me, too. Maybe we can start out with uh, you telling us a little bit about the farm, like where you said Pennsylvania. Can you talk a little bit about that locale? What and also maybe just kind of like what kind of acreage you're working on and those sorts of things? Yes, of course. We're uh, we're in what's called the Steam Valley, which is roughly a half hour north of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and an hour due south of Corning, New York. Um, The Steam Valley, it's kind of a misnomer because we're actually in the mountains of the Allegheny Plateau. Uh, It's a relatively uh, short, cool growing season, so we tend to focus on leafy greens and root crops. Uh, We've been farming here uh, since 1983, always managed the farm organically, it's been certified organic since 1987, and I think it's been the last three years we've added the Real Organic uh, Project label, mainly as a protest against uh, hydroponics and KFO farming uh, coming under the organic uh, label. Uh, our farm is roughly 90 acres, maybe 25 acres in woods. Uh, most of the rest of it we keep in permanent grass because it's quite steep or poorly drained. And then on six acres of the most level and well-drained soil, 
Uh, we rotate uh, dry land vegetables and cover crops. So in any given year, it's about half of the market garden in vegetables and half in cover crops. We also have almost a third of an acre uh, where we have access to water for irrigating, where we rotate uh, portable hoop houses with cover crops as well. Now, marketing is pretty much seasonal, beginning uh, middle of May, running through the middle of November. Uh, we're currently selling to one farmer's market and a couple of restaurants. Uh, but the marketing, like everything else, has changed quite a bit over the years. Yeah, what do you mean? I mean, did you were you doing like CSA, more CSA style for there for a while? Or like how, did it, how has it changed? Yeah, well, when we started out in the early 80s, um, we kind of leaned heavily on Anne's experience. She had worked on a large organic medicinal herb farm in the state of Washington. And because there wasn't really demand for organic produce in this region at the time, uh, we grew medicinal herbs, uh, primarily skullcap. Calendula and blessed thistle. I know blessed thistle sounds like a contradiction <laughs> in terms, but um, and then uh, we also branched out into storage crops. And just to give you an idea of how you may say you might say undeveloped the organic market was at the time, uh, just the onions, potatoes, um, garlic celery coming off of our small farm, we had to sell through two different uh, vegetable growers co-ops, one going into Washington, D.C., the other into New York City. We were selling to a distributor in Virginia, also going into D.C., a distributor in Philadelphia, as well as uh, Walnut Acres, which was a large organic mail order company at the time. Uh, by the end of the 80s, things had changed radically, and all of a sudden, uh, produce, organic produce was being airlifted in from California. Uh, we kind of saw the writing on the wall, and, and began uh, restaurant trade in Williamsport. That's about 25 miles, as I said, 25, 30 miles away. Uh, she was up to 12 uh, restaurants at one time, as well as a supermarket. And what they were looking for was really quality and um, storage aspects, you know, things holding up a long time. That's what they couldn't get uh, from their wholesalers. But nothing was advertised as organic or local or anything like that. And we thought for sure there must be a few people in the area interested in that. And so in the early 90s, and began attending a uh, farmer's market in Williamsport. Uh, we came in kind of with a, the niche of cool season crops. Most of the other growers were along the Susquehanna River with a, a long hot growing season, doing a lot of melons and tomatoes and peppers. And that slowly but surely took off, and now over 90% of our sales are through this one Saturday market. So, But we never did try CSA. Um, I, we know of a couple of farms that tried it and just never stuck with it. I don't know if it was what they were doing or if this area just wasn't right for the concept. Um, not too far away in State College, there's several thriving CSAs. So it it, it may just have to do with uh, the people in the area. Sure. Uh, so, and yeah, all those marketing things can be very contextual, certainly. Um, so one of the things that your farm is known for is farming with horses. Can you talk a little bit about how you all got into farming with horses? Yeah, I was... Uh, I almost think it's like the way many of us get into organic farming. We're kind of attracted by the philosophy of it. It just makes so much sense <laughs> in terms of the environment and how the world works. 
And but it's not until you actually get your hands in the soil, the opportunity to work on someone's organic farm that you find out if it's something that you really have a passion for or not. And I think you have to have that to <laughs> stick with it. And for me, it was the same thing with horses. Uh, I remember reading a couple of Wendell Berry's early books <clears throat> where he emphasized how much they completed the cycle on the farm. You know, the farms provide the fertility. <clears throat> you can harvest their fuel that's grown with the sun and they can reproduce themselves. Yeah, so I decided <clears throat> that this is something I really wanted to do. And I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work first on a Mennonite, Mennonite farm in Lancaster County, uh, this farmer's church. Uh, everyone farmed with modern tools, but he chose to stick with the way his father had done it, 100% horsepower. He had also been farming organically for 25 years at the time, so it was just a wonderful education by immersion. There was a young old order Amish farmer in the area who would come over and visit, and at the end of the summer, he said, well, will you work for me next summer? This is kind of unusual, but he wanted to transition his dairy to organic and thought it would be really good to have someone working with him who <laughs> valued that rather than just thought of it as extra work. And so that was another amazing experience. And then the following year, I decided to hitchhike my way across the country working on as many different farms as possible. And many of them were horse-powered farms, either uh, plain farmers or uh, otherwise. And I guess it was maybe a year or so into my trip, I ended up in uh, Washington State, uh, where Anne hired me. <laughs> and needless to say, that was the end of our, my journey. And we but it was very nice. We came back and both worked for the first farmer I worked for in Lancaster County. So she got to see firsthand what I was learning, got a chance to work the horses herself. So we were both really on board um, when we started farming uh, here in North Central PA. We did have a far, uh, tractor to start with, and that was mainly to make use of ads tractor driving skills and uh, she didn't tell me till later that she wasn't sure if he could really do it with horses <laughs> <laughs> but we uh i guess she became convinced and i don't know after a few years we were only putting a few hours on the tractor mainly just for pto work such as a chopper to mill uh, the medicinal herbs and uh, co for combining oats for the horses. And we decided, well, we we're just spending too much on repairs and we loaned it out and then uh, sold it and uh, have been doing it with just with the horses ever since. I think uh, also like or organic farming is you really can't just use input substitution, okay? It's just like, you can't just substitute chemical fertilizers with organic fertilizers. You need a whole fertility system uh, to make it work. And same way with the horses, you're not going to get too far if you just substitute horses for tractors. really have to think about designing the whole market garden uh, to utilize the potential of the horses. And one thing that was very clear to me working on these dairy and field crop farms is the, the horses were employed year round. I mean, there was always something going on, whether it was plowing or planting, cultivating, mowing hay, harvesting, working in the woods. And that is great for training the horses to have steady, consistent work. It's also the best way to get your return on investment in their feed, okay? It's feed, or if you want to call it fuel for a horse is a fixed cost. They have to be fed every day. And uh, 
of course, the more days out of the year you use them, uh, the, the better return you're going to get on their fuel. Kind of the opposite concept, maybe with a tractor, where the fewer hours you put on it, the better. Here, it's almost better to maximize the hours with the horses. Um, but when we started uh, growing vegetables, there were only a couple of examples of organic horse-powered farms that we knew of at that time. Uh, and they were both using the horses for primary tillage, the farm raised beds, and then everything else was, was hand tools, the planting, cultivating, and harvest. And so we decided, let's try row cropping the vegetables. In other words, growing the vegetables just the way you would plant a field of corn or soybeans or potatoes. And so even crops like uh, lettuce and spinach, we plant in wide rows. We were using a 34-inch uh, row spacing. Um, and we also found that by doing that, um, the crops really did a lot better without irrigation. When we tried doing multiple rows, inevitably uh, they would run out of uh, moisture before uh, they were up to market size. So that kind of reinforced uh, using uh, the horses and the old horse-drawn equipment, which was all set up for uh, row cropping. Um, and then to utilize them even more, I had mentioned earlier about how we set aside half of the market garden uh, for fallow, that is taking the land out of vegetable production and growing cover crops. Well, planting, mowing, incorporating the cover crops is kind of a uh, mimicking what you might think of as the haymaking and field crops on a traditional uh, field crop or dairy farm. So again, utilizing the horses uh, more in exchange, reducing the weed pressure. So we have a lot less of our own labor to go into things like weed management and fertility building. So that seemed like a good uh, trade-off in our minds. That's great. I, I, that, there's so many fascinating elements in there. Uh, a couple questions that kind of came up while you were talking. Are you still raising the oats for the horses or are you importing some of that or how's the feed work? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, our, our goal was to try to be as, you might say, fertility self-sufficient as possible. In other words, raising the feed for the horses and then they were providing all of the fertility for the market garden in terms of uh, compost made from their manure. Uh, that part of it has stayed the same. But when we made the transition from wholesaling to direct marketing, <laughs> we just simply didn't have the time uh, for making hay and harvesting oats. Uh, as well as doing all of the harvesting of vegetables on a weekly basis. Um, you know, particularly if you just get a small window of opportunity uh, to do something, it was made a lot more sense to be focusing on the vegetables than trying to put up hay. So we, we did uh, eventually let go of that and uh, are buying in hay, oats, as well as bedding. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I mean, that makes sense. You're right. You, uh, time is, <laughs> is valuable and you have to pick and choose some of these, some of these endeavors. Yeah. Um, I should say we know quite a few horse powered farms that do that, uh, do it all, but they all have fairly large apprentice crews. In other words, <laughs> it's not just two people trying to do it. It's three, four or five. So you can, you can uh, spread people around and get everything done. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually was also a question I had. Are you, do you have employees or is it, are you, or apprentices or anything like that? Or is it just you and Ann? Well, you know, one of our original goals for the farm was to keep it a two person operation. And we pretty much stuck with that with the first 20 or so years on the farm and it, it served us well. Um, 
Then we were, I guess you could say, uh, corrupted by this uh, agronomy professor at uh, Penn State. <laughs> and she had uh, set up this agroecology intern program in the summers, whereby college students from around the country would come in, they'd get kind of a crash course on organic farming in the classroom. Then they were sent out to farms for about eight weeks. As apprentices, they also completed some organic research on the farms. And then at the end of the summer, uh, they would kind of formalize that research and present it to each other. And uh, Heather Carson asked us if, if we would take two apprentices for this. And we thought, well, it's a great idea, but we aren't used to even one apprentice, <laughs> let alone two. And uh she came up with kind of a unique uh, sort of resolution to that. There was an organic, uh, uh, well, it was dairy farm at that time, also grain farm near here. And so the apprentices divided their time between the two farms. So three days or a week here and three days there. And, and that, you know, that worked well for all of us. And we realized that, wow, it, it did make our lives easier uh, we could do a little bit more uh, in terms of the uh, farmer's market. And really from then on, that was, I think, 2001. Uh, from then on, we've always had some part-time help. Generally, it's been about uh, 12 hours a week, primarily in the packing shed, which is kind of the bottleneck for us. Uh, occasionally, we'll have some more help on Friday, uh, getting ready for the farmer's market on Saturday. Sure. Yeah. The wash pack is uh, a bottleneck for, <laughs> for many of us. Um, the, so one of the things that I wanted to mention here is that my wife and I, our farm name is Rough Draft Farmstead. And that was born when we were interns where we met um, and we were kind of thinking about starting our own farm at that time. And we were joking about names and she's an artist, she's a painter and I'm uh, a writer. So rough draft kind of made sense. Um, and we were also like thinking, well, let's use horses one day. Like maybe that would be, you know, something that we could do. Uh, Cause I was very interested in that idea of, of all the, everything you're talking about is very fascinating to me. Um, and so we, uh, you know, talked about that, but there were two realities we ran into. Um, one was that finding enough land to justify a horse was difficult in our price range, which was not very much money. Um, and then the other thing that we ran into is we kind of slowly were stopping any sort of tillage. Like we were kind of moving away from any sort of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of groundwork that we would normally, I had normally associated with sort of draft horses. Um, and so, uh, but one of the things that I think is really interesting about what you and Anne have done and some of the things that you and I have talked about just online uh, is that you have found uh, very low or shallow tillage options or ways of utilizing your horses and uh, some no-till ways of using your horses. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can kind of explore some of that uh, and kind of, I don't know, maybe dispel that idea that you know, they're, they're strictly sort of for plowing and, you know, making hay and stuff. But I also think about, yeah, just the horse in the plow. Um, yeah. So maybe talk a little bit, uh, wherever you want to start with that, if you want to start with the garlic or if you want to start somewhere else, but I'd love to hear some of the ways in which you've found, uh, utilizing horses in sort of that low, no tillage sort of way. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Jesse, I should say we've, we've had a few rough draft horses, but we're, uh, most of them have turned out pretty well, but you know, I think there's many different ways of getting into, let's say, alternative tillage for a very kind of broad term. Um, and I think uh, it kind of comes down to, you know, what are your goals for overall soil management? And the really driving goal for us, because we're not irrigating, is moisture conservation. And so we found that, um, you know, the traditional, what you think of moldboard plow with the horses, is a very efficient way to turn under sod or a cover crop and make a clean seedbed. 
Uh, but boy, does it dry out the soil. I mean, we're up on a hilltop. You've got a week of dry, windy weather. Um, you know, maybe you could plant corn, but certainly not carrots or salad mix. And so we, we were kind of forced to experiment with different ways of trying to conserve moisture as much as possible. And what we found is simply using very shallow tillage um, was the best solution for us. Okay, so in a sense, what we're doing is we're trying to incorporate the cover crop residues just to the top two, maybe three inches of soil. So we get a kind of cover crop soil mulch. And that, uh, first of all, really improves uh, infiltration. We get a heavy rain, that mulch will absorb it so it doesn't run off. And at the same time, it tends to slow down any evaporation from moisture uh, coming up to the surface. Um, by contrast, we found a strictly no-till situation with no soil disturbance. The soil could actually get pretty hard and crusted and uh, become too dry to plant. Uh, I realize this would be very different if we were using a thick mulch of compost. You know, that would, of course, keep the moisture in. But kind of another arbitrary goal of ours was to rely strictly on the manure from the horses as our organic matter input to the fields. And uh, we kind of calculated that even if we were to concentrate it all on a quarter acre, at best we might be able to put down an inch of uh, compost a year. Um, where the way we're doing it now, of course, we're spreading it out over a lot more acres. On the other hand, we're not planting that intensively either. Um, so the, the one, uh, I should say, uh, exception to that is if we can put down a cover crop mulch just as soon as we plant, or preferably even before we plant. And the issue there for us is that because of having a relatively cool climate, uh, it just kept the ground too cool and moist for most vegetables. Uh, the exception being garlic. Garlic seems to love uh, the cool, moist conditions under a cover crop mulch. And it's also much more slug tolerant than the other uh, vegetables we grow in the market garden. Um, so we really decided uh, this is the place to do a strictly uh, no-till approach. Uh, we do use uh, cover crop mulch uh, for other crops in the market garden, but most of them we have done some pre-plant tillage. Uh, we've gotten vegetables established and then apply the mulch. After the soils warmed up, uh, most of the issues with slugs have disappeared. Um, so I don't know if uh, you're willing to entertain a slightly different spelling of of no-till, but instead of thinking of it as N-O, we kind of like to spell it K-N-O-W. <laughs> and and that, that becomes very inclusive then. But, you know, just really knowing why we're tilling or why we're not tilling and knowing the best way of going about it to meet our soil management goals, knowing when to do it and knowing how long to do it. And, you know, that's as opposed to just tilling by rote, okay? Horse farmers have always mold board plow, so we're going to mold board plow, and that's the way we're always going to do it, rather than just kind of stepping back and seeing, well, what do we really need to do here? <laughs> uh, but we're, we're constantly experimenting. We're always changing uh, and, you know, if you're interested, I can go into a blow-by-blow blow on how we do the garlic or any of, any of the other crops that we grow. Uh, yeah, let's do, let's go through the garlic. I know I will also, just for the listener, um, share the video that you made uh, that's really excellent, that show, that kind of gives you a visual accompaniment to, to what you're about to describe. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think maybe just go start from wherever you want to start on that process. 
Okay, so the, you know, garlic is a overwintering vegetable. So we're planting it in the fall of the fallow year. And so just to set the stage, we plant or have a cover crop growing at the beginning of the fallow year like normal. This might be a cover crop either planted in the spring or established into the previous year's vegetables. We typically mow that cover crop a couple of times, apply a light application of horse manure or compost, and then work it into the soil shallowly. And we often do a series of what you might call stale seed beds. In other words, repeated shallow cultivation, maybe once every couple of weeks over a four or six week period uh, to flush out weed seeds. So in a sense, we're doing all of the fertility building and weed management before we even uh, plant the garlic. Um, And then we want to plant the garlic into a cover crop of oats in the fall. And we want to maximize the biomass of that cover crop as much as possible. And so we found we typically are planting our German white garlic around the 4th to 8th of uh, October. So we back up two months and plant the oats between the 4th and 8th of August. And we're trying to get two and a half to three and a half feet of top growth. The oats is already heading out. So we're creating a really straw-like material. And that's in order to maximize uh, the mulch that we're growing right in place. And then, uh, you know, I shouldn't leave out this kind of important detail, at least in, in our location, is we find it helpful to plant the oats on ridges, okay? So we'll be planting the garlic as a single row in the top of this ridge. You might think of it as like a single row raised bed, mini raised bed. And the benefit of this is it's enhanced uh, drainage and aeration uh, for the crop since it's going to be under this uh, mulch the whole time. And for so we, we do this simply by broadcasting the oat seed and then forming the ridges. And we do this with disc killers. It would be similar to hilling uh, potatoes, the same kind of setup. There is both the seed and it concentrates that shallowly incorporated compost and cover crop residue into the ridges as well. So we get a really nice Uh, growing conditions there. So when it comes time to plant the garlic, it's simply a matter of rolling it down just to facilitate planting. We use a a coulter packer for the job. And then using one of our old uh, horse-drawn cultivators, we open up a furrow for planting the garlic. We just have a coulter mounted in the front. You might think of that as a flat sharp disc that slices through the residue. And then in the back, a narrow tooth that opens up a kind of slot in the soil. <clears throat> and then we go along and, and hand plant the garlic cloves. It's, I don't know if it's quite as fast as planting in the tilled soil, but it, it, it moves right along. And <clears throat> I should say that that is plenty of mulch right there to overwinter the garlic. And part of that is we're planting into this big root system of the oats. And I think that's what prevents the garlic from heaving uh, just as much as the residue cover on the surface of the soil. But it's not enough mulch material uh, for long-term moisture preservation. I mean, we won't be harvesting the garlic till the next July. So we need a much more substantial mulch And so we plant additional oats on either side of the garlic. So if you were standing, say, at the end of one of our half-acre fields, most of our fields are roughly 60 feet wide by uh, 380 feet long, 
Uh, so you're looking down the length of the field. We would have the garlic planted on these ridges in the middle of the field. On either side, we have oats planted on flat ground. Uh, as soon as we planted the garlic, then we mow the oats in these adjacent plots, let it dry for a couple of weeks, and then rake it into windrows right next to the garlic and walk those windrows in uh, to mulch the pathways. So it's, it's actually found it's faster and easier than hauling in bales of straw and breaking them up. And the, that long stem rye, you know, it's very different than uh, that rye, I'm sorry, long stem oats. Uh, it hasn't been chopped up like in a bale. Uh, so that it will last a long time. It doesn't break down, doesn't blow away in a hard wind. And we're able to use, you know, our old traditional horse-drawn equipment for this. You know, a sickle bar mower. I think it's over a century old. An old side delivery hay rake. Um, so it kind of keeps things simple. Um, so that, that is basically it for the garlic until we uh, remove the scapes and, and harvest the crop. Quick question, just like a technical follow-up, was the, after you put that garlic in, how are you covering the garlic? Like, are you just covering it with the hay or are you pushing soil back over top of it? Yeah, you know, look, we are, we are kind of squeezing the soil back over it, okay? So there is a little bit of loose soil thrown up on the edges of the furrow. Uh, you can either just push that back in with your hand and kind of squeeze the slot uh, shut. Or our uh, part-time employee of many years, Naomi, came up with this uh, really slick way of doing it. You might have noticed it in the video. She simply just uh, walks along and pushes it together with her feet. <laughs> no stoop labor necessary. So. Yeah, that's anything you can do with your feet. Yeah, that's <laughs> prefer that. My back always prefers that, certainly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by the Marble Seed Organic Farming Conference. All right, everyone, important public service announcement. I know some of you are already making plans for how you'll spend the winter, ordering tools, researching seeds, projecting crops. It's also a great time to gather with other farmers to share knowledge and skills. This February, join thousands of farmers like you from across the U.S. for three days of community building and farmer-led learning at the 35th annual Marble Seed Organic Farming Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Find out more and register at marbleseed.org slash conference. That's marbleseed.org slash conference. Today's episode is also brought to you by High Country News. High Country News is an independent, nonprofit publication that has been covering the Western United States for more than 50 years. High Country News provides unique, on the ground reporting on the land, water, wildlife, and communities of the region, with dedicated coverage of climate, environmental, and indigenous issues. Sign up for free newsletters or a trial of the magazine at hcn.org. That's hcn.org slash no till. All right, back to the show. You mentioned like the shallow tillage a couple of times. What tool are you using? Like when you were talking about the, the sort of stale seed bedding, um, what tool are you, what implement are you using to, to sort of do that shallow tillage work? So it, it does depend on uh, the cover crop, you know, whether it's a live overwintered cover crop, a short term size, something that's mow killed or winter killed. Um, you know, I, I should maybe point out that one of the benefits of the no-till garlic system is those adjacent uh, parcels where we've removed the oat straw to mulch the garlic. We're left with this short oat stubble. And the next spring, the soil there warms up and dries out quickly. And it's very easy to plant early vegetables with minimum tillage. In that case, we're just using uh, the same horse-drawn cultivator with some teeth on it just to loosen the soil maybe a couple of inches deep and form a bed for planting. So that is probably the least uh, 
least case scenario of tillage. Um, more typically, we use, um, well, it's a little hard to describe it. We call it an undercutter ridger. So we use the same shank that you might have seen in the video for opening up a furrow for planting a garlic. But instead of a near, narrow tooth on the bottom, we have a 12-inch sweep. This would be like a cultivator sweep, or sometimes it's called a duck's foot uh, shovel. And on top of that, we've mounted a potato shovel that would be normally used for making a furrow, big furrow for planting potatoes. And what that does is it kind of slows the soil that's being undercut by the sweep. So in a sense, you're going across the field every 18 inches. We're undercutting, throwing the soil into ridges. It's kind of a way to deal with a lot of residue without it plugging up the equipment. Uh, then we often follow up with a uh, spring tooth harrow where we've simply spread the teeth farther apart than normal so it can handle a lot of residue, again, without uh, plugging up. And then we often finish with kind of an unusual application of a rotary hoe. I don't know if you're familiar with that tool. It's commonly used in row crops uh, for weed control, um, attached to a tractor going, say, 8 to 10 miles an hour to kick up the surface of the soil, kill all those small weeds in the white thread stage, just before or after, say, corn or soybeans emerge. Of course, going at a horse's pace, <laughs> we're not creating that kind of action. It's just poking a lot of holes in the soil and bringing, actually, the residue that's been somewhat incorporated back up to the surface. Uh, so we get kind of reestablish this nice uh, cover crop mulch in a couple of inches of loose soil. So that might be the way we would do the initial cover crop incorporation. And then in terms of the follow-up stale seed bedding, it would usually be a combination of the spring tooth harrow, rotary hoe, and or cultipacker. And we would use the cultipacker, or some people might call it a roller, to intentionally refirm the soil to get weeds to germinate, okay? I mean, the whole idea is to flush weed seed out of the soil. It doesn't do too much good if you just have a field of dry soil sitting there and no weeds germinating. So we need to somehow trick them in, into growing. I should say that most of our fields now, the weed pressure is so low that we sometimes incorporate a cover crop and seed it at the same time. That is, we would just broadcast the seed on the cover crop stubble, do this shallow tillage sequence that would incorporate the cover crop and incorporate the cover crop seed at the same time. Uh, so you've basically reduced your cover, your weed seed bank to so little that you don't have to worry about that stale seed bedding. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we always have to observe what's going on in the field. But generally speaking, uh, we don't have to do it, or we're basically just stale seed bedding in the process of preparing the seed bed for the next cover crop or crop. I think for us, the bigger issue is, again, moisture management. So if we are incorporating a live cover crop, which can take a lot of moisture out of the soil, we typically want to give ourselves at least four and preferably six to eight weeks before we plant the next crop. Um, and, and here we're talking about a vegetable crop rather than a cover crop, which is a little more forgiving, in order to make sure we've had at least one substantial rain uh, to re-moisten the soil. So what's really driving things now is more moisture management than weed management. Do you have any issues with like uh, any sort of rhizomatous grasses or any other weeds that are more, you know, invasive or perfect or uh, intense than 
in some of you know the ones that can be dealt with in a stale seed bedding? Yeah, you know, when we started here, um, we, these were old hay fields, and they were completely infested with quackgrass, which. If you're familiar with it, it is a rhizominous weed. And uh, what we did to try to get rid of it once and for all was an extended uh, bare fallow in the summer. And just um, what we did is we moldboard plow as shallowly as possible and then use uh, spring tooth harrow deeply to bring those rhizomes back up to the surface and dehydrate them. And so that would be, again, maybe every 10 days or so, uh, hitting the field, try to uh, dehydrate the rhizomes. Now, of course, you can have a wet summer, in which case the goal is really just trying to starve their energy reserves. And, um, you know, this is something you have to use some common sense with, obviously, plowing up a large section of side hill, keeping exposed all summer uh, would not uh, be good soil care at all. Uh, But, you know, with a little bit of forethought and keeping the fields uh, in a nice size, it seems to work pretty well for us. We would always follow that up with a early uh, cover crop or rye or something to rebuild uh, the soil structure after that prolonged tillage and kind of starve any uh, residual rhizomes at that point. Um, you know, we, we certainly know people that have managed to do the same thing with kind of back-to-back cover crops. Uh, so there, there are many ways of going about it. Um Quackgrass, of course, is always trying to encroach from the field ends, uh, so we have to kind of keep on top of that. Uh, For a number of years in the beginning, we would uh, manage what some people call a a weed moat. In other words, keeping a tilled area all around the perimeter of the fields to prevent that encroachment of, of weeds. Uh, we ended up finding that that was a soil erosion hazard because, uh, for the most part, we manage things that there is no erosion happening in our fields, but water may still run off, hits the field end, and then goes down the field end. Well, if you have a long run of bare soil there, uh, that's where we will get uh, gullies forming and so on, and, and we just didn't want to contend with that. So we just do a, uh, how would I say, strategically in a staggered way, we will work the field ends as necessary. And sometimes we'll just do it by hand if we don't think uh, tillage is acceptable to use. Yeah, the the weed moat. I like that. I've not heard that phrase. Um, the uh, So one of the things I think is interesting and that we kind of mentioned is the the idea of like you know using these horses in this fashion of like lower reduced tillage um ways are there other examples that you've seen of sort of using horses that way of of not just going straight moldboard plow for everything we didn't know of many examples starting out um but you know it's interesting um uh, One of the reasons we were attracted to this particular area is there was a a small uh, Amish community here, and they were great neighbors that was helping us out, sharing equipment, loaning us a horse if we needed. Sometimes we would milk their cows when they were away. So that was just a really nice arrangement. Uh, Unfortunately for us, uh, their community never grew to the point that they could stay here, and they eventually left. But the uh, the one farmer uh, was kind of ahead of his time. This was back in the 80s, and he got into using a large offset disc uh, for all of their tillage. So, you know, again, you're, you're working the soil maybe five or six inches deep, but keeping all of the corn stalks, oat stubble, whatever, in the surface of the soil. 
And he at one time was, or he and his family were farming uh, three farms, which was a, a lot to do with horses. And one of the benefits for him was time saving. He, uh, he would put nine horses in this offset disc and could cover probably three or four times as much ground as if he was uh, moldboard plowing for the same number of horses. And I would say a little bit later than that, I was became aware of different uh, plain farmers in certain communities that were getting into uh, no-till, but this was all chemical no-till, you know, plant and, and spray. On the organic side, um, I do know a couple of farmers. I'm sure there are many more. I'm, I'm kind of out of the loop, so I don't uh, want to give the impression that there's only uh, a few of us doing it. But uh, one of them, uh, you know, from uh, moderating the EFAO uh, session on large-scale organic uh, vegetable farms, and that's Ken Lang in Ontario. And... Uh, you know, for that experiment that he was running, he was using a, a tractor because that's what they wanted him to use because this was being pitched for larger scale farmers. But up until that point, uh, he was doing everything with horses and he continues to. And, uh, you know, he's a real m mechanical uh, whiz engineer and he had rigged up a no-till uh, water, wheel, water wheel horse-drawn transplanter for plantings right into cover crops, I, as well as a strip-till rig, a uh, horse-drawn no-till grain drill, as well as a uh, cover crop roller crimper. So uh, in the cover crop-based uh, no-till, I would say he is way ahead of the game and it would be fun to touch base with him see how much he's he's doing on that with the horses right now um on the other side um which might be much more familiar to many of, uh, of your listeners is uh, what Stephen leslie in vermont is doing with a deep compost mulch uh intensive uh vegetable system uh, Stephen and his uh, partner, Kerry Gewalt, have a Jersey dairy and uh, vegetable, I guess primarily CSA, maybe some farmer's market too, uh, which they had run the vegetables kind of uh, as a cover crop tillage-based system. And then very convicted about concerns with uh, climate change and trying to capture soil carbon, kind of switched overnight uh, to the no-till compost mulch system, uh, used the horses uh, to prepare the land and form permanent raised beds, and then uh, to apply the compost simply you know, with a tractor and spreader, you can just creep along to put down a heavy load of compost. I think his alternative was simply to make many trips back and forth across the beds to get a deep mulch. And, um, and you know, I think they've been quite successful with it. They're in a nice situation where because of the dairy, they're producing uh, lots of compost. So they have compost to spare. And they're also already using a tractor and front end loader for making the compost. So that makes it fairly efficient to load the manure spreader to spread the compost. Um, but it does, is going back to what I said earlier about designing a horse powered system. Uh, now, there's not a whole lot of work for the horses to do in the market garden. I'm sure he keeps them busy with other things on the farm, but. It's basically uh, my impression is spreading the compost and then everything else is handwork. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it was also interesting just talking now about that Ken Lang conversation for the listener who wants to go back. I think that was maybe winter of 2021. I uh, did a, a, a round table there that was really cool. But I did honestly, I loved Ken's contribution and didn't even know he farmed with horses. So, um, and maybe he mentioned it, but I don't remember it. But uh, that's very cool to hear. Maybe we'll have to catch back up with Ken at some point. 
one thing that uh, I know you maybe touched on it there for a minute, but do you want to talk a little bit about like your interceding procedure and like how that works with cropping? Because you sent me this picture that's really beautiful that I'll make sure to post on our Instagram uh, so that people can see it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about like incorporating like what you use to incorporate uh, you know, in interceding into your production and like what the, maybe just like an example of how, uh, you know, that works sort of chronologically, I guess. Well, I'll give it a try. Um, you know, on, on our farm, I think weed management and interceding really go hand in hand uh, because to do interceding efficiently, you really need low weed pressure. I mean, you don't want to have to go back in and hand weed after establishing the interceding. By the same token, when you have low weed pressure, you really need to intercede because the soil is bare. There's no weeds to protect it. So we, in a sense, we have to plant our own weed cover. And you know, maybe the best way to illustrate it is with that photo, if you're going to post it anyway. Uh, that was a field um, of fall brassicas, okay? So they're planted in rows and they're alternated with short-term low-growing crops such as lettuce and spinach and salad mix. And what's kind of nice about that is those short, short-term crops are harvested. Now you have a big open aisle for harvesting the brassicas that go late into the fall. It's also excellent for air circulation, um, as opposed to having a solid field of uh, brassicas. But in terms of the interseeding, um, you have to visualize all of these crops are planted on 34 inches rows, okay, rows 34 inches apart. And we're going to come back and seed the row middle, okay, the pathway. Typically, with that scenario, it's three to four weeks after transplanting the vegetables. And in this case, and we set up our cultivator. We typically cultivate our crops once. That's partly to loosen the soil, to slow down evaporation. And it's also to loosen the soil and the pathways for direct seeding uh, the cover crop. Because uh, we're using a walk-behind seeder, and that's pretty hard to no-till. I mean, it's hard to go to a, to a firm soil. Uh, so our cultivator is set up so that there is a tooth that lines up with the middle of the pathway. That's leaving a loose, open furrow, which we can just put uh, the walk-behind seeder in that and walk it up and down the rows. It's fairly fast and easy to do. Uh, in that case, we used a Planet Junior. Uh, we've also used a Jang. The Jang is, is really nice if there's a lot of residue, but we found it only puts the seed maybe a half inch deep at the most. And if we're in kind of dry soil, and you can imagine the pathways are not a fine seed bed, like where we planted the soil. I mean, we've been walking there and running over it with a cultivator. So the Planet Junior, we can get the seed in uh, an inch or two, maybe not two inches, but an inch, inch and a half deep, uh, which, you know, ensures uh, germination in dry conditions a little better. Um, so I think that's about it. It's, it's we're row cropping the veg vegetables and we're also row cropping the inner seeding. But as you saw there, the uh, rye, when it's planted at the end of the summer, um, <clears throat> stays low growing, but it really stools out. You know, so uh, I would say that we, let's say we planted the brassicas, you know, thinking we interceded around the second week of August. And that photo was the middle of September. So maybe a month, probably five weeks later, it's already stooled out and protecting maybe a third of the bed. You have the vegetables covering most of the rest of the bed. So we have, we have pretty good cover at that point. And of course, the roots are right where it's most erosion prone. In other words, the pathway is just 
slightly down, it's just a little bit of a furrow. Can't really call it a raised bed there, but the, the pathway is a little depressed. <clears throat> we get a heavy rain that will act like a gutter where the water wants to run off, and that's where we want to focus our protection. Another one that we like quite a bit is hairy vetch. That would be more for uh, June or July interseeding. And, you know, when it's planted by itself that time of year, it lays flat on the ground. There's nothing for it to grow up. Like, you know, typically it's planted with rye and then it crawls up the rye. So this makes this beautiful mat right over the pathway. Um, so it, it doesn't interfere with the crop or for air circulation or for walking through to harvest. The only thing is that eventually the vines will start to grow into the cash crop. And if it's a longer term crop, we actually will trim back the vines using uh, disc killers or coulters. Again, all we're trying to do is just slice through the vines on either side of the row to prevent them from growing up on top of the vegetables. And um, that. You know, it requires setting up the cultivator to do it, but it's much, much faster than trying to mow or weed whack a, uh, say, a seeding of clover or something like that in the past place. Uh, we've also used uh, buckwheat if it's a short term vegetable. <clears throat> the vegetable comes off and then the buckwheat comes into bloom. It's a nice way to get a staggering kind of insectuary effect across the market garden. And uh, crimson clover in the fall is another nice one as well. Uh, I don't know if you would have caught this in the garlic video, but when we're talking about the cover crop at the start of the fallow year, one option was uh, cover crops interseeded and overseeded in the preceding year's vegetables. In that case, it was fall crops, kind of like what you saw in the photo today. And so if you can imagine the next spring, you have these rows of crimson clover greening up. Most of the vegetables, <clears throat> excuse me, have died back over winter. And if we don't want to work it up at that point, uh, we simply frost seed. So in that particular case, we frost seeded, I think it was Italian ryegrass and red clover. And so that will fill in. And so later in the spring, we have a, a solid cover crop without having to start over again, working up the field and replanting it. Again, something we couldn't have done before we got to the point of low weed pressure. Yeah, sure. And it's be I just love looking at it. It's just this pure mass of photosynthesis and it's just, it's really elegant and clean. And, uh, yeah, it looks, I, I, uh, anybody who's listening to this who can go to Instagram to the no-till growers Instagram and check out that photo. Um, and uh, I'm curious before we get off, I'd like to know, like, I think this is kind of two questions, but maybe it's one. Um, how have you seen your soil change since you've been sort of using these methods, especially like incorporating more of the cover crops and the interseeding and those sorts of things. And then are you, what are you using to measure that? Like what's your sort of soil testing, uh, you know, strategy? Yeah, that's at least two questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would say, well, the biggest improvement I would say since we started you know, devoting at least half of the market garden to cover crops and using shallow tillage is dramatically reducing problems with the soil crusting. That was a big issue in our first years. In fact, if we were going to grow a crop like carrots, uh, we pretty much had to put down row cover or something to, so we didn't, after heavy rain, the soil didn't bake and crust and lead to poor germination. So um, that, that uh, I think, was sort of the most, the biggest observable change. Um, otherwise, I think we've kind of hit a, a steady, steady state. You know, we're using 
relatively small amounts of compost because of this kind of self-imposed goal of only using the manure from the horses. And our, it kind of depends which lab you go by. Uh, the organic matter is kind of settled at three and a half percent with some labs, closer to three percent with others. So you kind of say a moderate range, nothing fantastic, but not bad either. Um, you know, that's that's your kind of common soil test measure. Uh, we've been involved with the PASA soil health benchmark study since 2018. It's kind of a, a very interesting uh, research project. Um, I don't know. I think they're up to maybe 150 farms now in the project, vegetable farms, uh, pasture, livestock farms, and grain farms. Not all necessarily organic, but everyone, I think, sustainably minded. And uh, they're Two components to this project. Uh, one is manage, manage, excuse me, monitoring each farm's soil management uh, practices. Uh, so we're keeping track of orga organic matter inputs, our tillage. They, for, we have to record each type of tool used and how often, and then they come up with a tillage index for that. And then they're also looking at the days of live cover. Okay, so that's from when you plant to when you kill, whether it's a vegetable, cover crop, or sod. And that is paired with uh, annual uh, soil testing, which is done through the Cornell Soil Health Lab. And I think they call that soil test the Cornell assessment of soil health or cash for so short and there are 10 components of that well actually there are 12 but PASA is not using the uh, compaction measurements because that requires a soil penetrometer and you really need the same soil moisture conditions on every farm to make a comparison so they decided not to get into that but uh, there are physical aspects of soil health, such as aggregate stability and available water uh, capacity. There are biological indicators, such as uh, organic matter, soil protein, respiration index, active carbon. I can try to explain these things to you if you're interested. <laughs> And then there are the, the basic chemical ones that most of us are familiar with, like pH, phosphorus, potassium, uh, minor elements, and then an overall score. And there's, there, there are two ways that this is rated. First of all, uh, there's a benchmark comparing your farm results to all of the other farms in the Cornell database, okay? So that would be grain farms, dairy farms, orchards, backyards, gardens. And the comparison is made just with the same soil texture. Okay, so I think according to their test, our soil is rated as a loam. So you'd be comparing, say, organic matter levels with all other farms with a loam soil texture. That's because you know, it's harder to maintain organic matter with a sandy soil than a loam soil, and it's harder with a loam soil than a clay soil. Clay soil. So it's a, it's a way to make a fairer comparison. Um, and then for the PASA study, then you're also comparing those results with all of your PASA peers, okay? So you can see how uh, you're ranked with the other vegetable growers in the study. So I guess just to hone in on maybe our best and our worst <laughs> results, uh, where we have consistently done well is with active carbon. And active carbon is that part of the organic matter in the soil that's a readily available energy source for the biology. You know, that's what the microbes can eat. 
and do their thing and release nutrients. And not surprisingly, because we're adding, you know, consistently adding fresh cover crop residues, our active carbon tends to be in the optimum range. Okay, uh, Cornell gives a rating from zero to 100, 80 to 100 is optimum, 60 to 80 is excellent, and so on down uh, to zero. Uh, so that, that was kind of reassuring. What was actually kind of uh, devastating for us to find out is our, our aggregate stability has uh, consistently been low or very low. That is, you know, around sort of 10 to 20. And we just assumed with the cover crops and the root systems that would, you know, maybe not be high, but would be kind of in a average range. And also just to look at our soil when we're getting ready to plant, there's beautiful crumbs in it. You know, people have often remarked on it. Um, but, you know, the the aggregates we're measuring are kind of microscopic. They're smaller than the, the crumbs we tend to see, just picking up the soil in our fingers. And, uh, you know, what? that's kind of, uh, how would I say, we're maintaining good production and planting conditions despite this, but this is obviously an area where we could improve. And... Uh, you know, it's given us, you know, we're what, 40 years into this, you kind of get complacent with your system. It's kind of given us incentive to try new things. And I think probably what's going to help us the most is including more uh, short term or preferably long term sod in the rotation, you know, rather than just a four to eight month cover crop going uh, a year and a half to two and a half years. And, and we're kind of changing things around a little bit so we can do that. In some cases going with a, a two-year sod and then maybe one or two years of vegetables. And that's a little bit easier for us to do because as we get older, we're slowly scaling back our production. So we actually have a little bit more room that we can set aside for cover crops and maybe squeeze in here or there a two-year sod rather than just the year of uh, annual cover crops. Eric Nordell, that was amazing. I really appreciate your time uh, and chatting with us and sharing all this uh, amazing stuff you have going on. And um, yeah, I, I just really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you, Jesse. And as I said at the beginning, I I love the podcast and the videos, and it's it's part of our journey of always uh, learning from others. So it's just been wonderful. I can share our little experience going on here. All right. Well, uh, once again, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, I'm sending my best to you and Ann. Well, thank you. And uh, it's been wonderful to talk with you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, by the time you hear this, I will have wrapped up the Oak Conference here in Kentucky, and I'm sure it was awesome. It always is. Uh, next up, I am super excited to be doing a Nerdy Farmer Jesse workshop in mid-February with Dallas Inner City Growers. Uh, check the show notes for details on that. I don't get to Texas very often, so come hang. I will also be at the Marble Seed Conference in Wisconsin towards the end of February, but not presenting there, just hanging out, repping the No-Till Growers brand, uh, trying to learn more about what it's like to farm in that region as well. I will also also be at the Organic Grower School outside of Asheville, North Carolina in March, and I thought that would be the last one, but I will actually be in Riverside, California for the Grow Riverside and Beyond Conference in early April. So that should be a blast, uh, and the last one, I think, but we'll see. All the links for those in the show notes and also linked in the show notes is our shop where you can find my book, The Living Soil Handbook and hats and other merch. Those things help to support our work. Uh, alternatively, you can join the hundreds of donors who support us at patreon.com slash no-till growers and who just this week learned of a bunch of new discounts from various companies on seeds and footwear and all sorts of other goodies. So not only can you support our work, but get a sweet bonus in the process. But that Patreon page is the absolute lifeblood of our work and at a certain level, or if you just 
just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Chris Yates, Sean at All About the Garden, and Stephen Smith. Huge shout out to everyone who supports us in whatever way that you can. You all are amazing. Otherwise, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week. Bye. Bye.